back uh, audience at home at the third and final part of our conference, Curating the Internet. Um, it will be chaired, moderated by Annette Decker, who I would like to invite into, uh, um, into the session again. Um, she will be uh, interviewing our guests today and also leave it up to Annette to, uh, to introduce uh, the guests. So Annette, uh, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Arjan. So we have uh, three guests today, and I'm very honored to indeed uh, talk to them today. And uh, yeah, please, if you have any questions, do pose them in the channels that were uh, meant to be for that. And uh, we'll raise them at the end of the presentations, actually. So what we're gonna do is uh, each of the, uh, of the presenters will give a short introduction to their work of about 10 minutes. Uh, there may be a short question if you have for clarification or anything like that, but the main discussion will happen after all the three presenters uh, have done their own little presentation. So, first of all, we'll have Valentina Tenni, who is an art historian, curator and lecturer, and she's interested in the relationships between art and technology, with a particular focus on internet cultures. Currently, she is what you can see here as well, adjunct professor at Politecnico University in Milan and also affiliated with the new Academy of Fine Arts in Rome and Milan. She has published actually several books, among others are Meme Culture, the Memesthetica, if I pronounce that correctly, in which she connects actually Duchamp uh, to TikTok. Uh, unfortunately, the publication, uh, if you don't read Italian, uh, is not available in uh, other languages but Slovenian since uh, last year, uh, published by Axioma. And if I'm correct, it's also going to be published in English soon in this fall. Uh, Valentina, can I ask you to, to join and uh, start the presentation? So can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for for the presentation. And of course, I will also like to thank uh, Impact for the invitation and Arion. Um, uh, it is such a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, to get the chance to to discuss uh, this topic with all of you. Um, so uh, as you said, I am an art historian and I'm a, also a curator and a lecturer. I'm based in Rome, Italy. And in this presentation, I'm going to share a few things that I think I learned during my uh, curatorial activity in the field of new media, especially regarding the issue of like how to present the new. Um, so um, let's see if the clicker works. Give me just a second. Okay, yeah. So um, this story starts with uh, uh, an exhibition that I curated in 2002 so this was exactly uh, 20 years ago and the show was titled netizens and and it was my uh, very first group show uh, in a gallery it included uh, works by five artists uh jody cory archangel uh, carlo zanni limited zero and il out the cock and the idea behind the show was uh twofold um, first of all I uh, felt the need to introduce like the public to the world of internet art, which I was very interested in. And I, I made my uh, final thesis in the university uh, on internet art. And that topic was very little known uh, in Italy at the time. So, uh, um, but secondly, um, I also wanted to approach this topic in, like in a broad way. Uh, showing artworks that were um, heavily influenced by internet culture, but not necessarily tied to the web as a medium. So in the show, you could find, uh, for example, uh, softwares and game modifications made by artists, but also paintings and prints. So, uh, so when I got the invitation to speak today about how to present digital art, keeping uh, some sort of critical distance from hype tendencies, also offering um, a valuable alternative to the mainstream narratives that surround digital culture, like that, that, are, that as we all know, are often based on uh, sensationalism and, and, and myth making. 
So my mind immediately went back to that first exhibition because in that particular circumstance, uh, not only I had, of course, uh, as you can imagine, uh, I had to confront with a lot of technical glitches and display dilemmas, uh, which are the norm in this kind of exhibition, as I would later learn. But I was also immediately um, confronted with this specific problem of hype. So the problem of how uh, to deal with technological hype, how to offer some sort of uh, um, counterbalancing narrative uh, uh, that maybe with art we can we can provide. So um, the story is is that um, it goes like this: when when we sent out the first press release of the exhibition, uh, we received a couple of calls from newspaper journalists that were interested in getting more information about the show, and that was already a bit weird because. Um, I, I know, um, how can I say that? I mean, the show was not taking place uh, in a major museum. Uh, there were not, I mean, the people involved were not well personality at, personalities at the time. Uh, but the big surprise came on the opening night because uh, we were actually uh, surprised by the arrival of television crews with cameras. And, and I mean, that uh, uh, exhibition was just um, a little fringe show in a private gallery, but apparently, uh, the sentence net art exhibition in the press release was powerful enough to attract that kind of media attention. Um, so let me just go on with the, yeah, I don't know if it works. Yeah, so uh, you can see in, in the video, uh, this is like me on the news trying to keep a straight face uh, when the journalist, like pointing to a game modification by Jody, uh, began to ask me silly questions like, are these just a bunch of angry computers? Um, so that was the first time I became aware of the problems that come with presenting artworks and cultural projects in general that involve new technologies, because I had the chance to observe very closely how strong the hype around the internet was and how that could affect my curatorial projects, my curatorial uh, thinking. So that experience led me to pay uh, a lot more attention to my personal discourse about technology, about progress, and also to uh, reflect on the role of art in this particular context. And I think that uh, was immediately clear to me uh, was the fact that hype works like a some sort of giant filter that tends to obscure uh, the art and tends to reduce the complexity of cultural phenomena. And, and also sometimes it steers the public attention and the public discourse towards all kinds of wrong directions. Uh, in this slide, you can see my second exhibition that was titled Loading, Genetically uh, Modified Video Games, which was a, um, a show about game art uh, that opened in 2003 in Sicily. Um, that show was also very important for me for similar reason because it, it led me to confront with these uh, issues even more. Um, and finally, uh, another uh, important moment in my uh, personal history. Um, I don't know if the slide. Okay, here it is. Uh, another important moment in my personal uh, curating history was this exhibition that I made in 2014 in uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, organized by Axioma, uh, which is also, I mean, this exhibition is also the point of departure of the research that led to the publication of the book that Annette was mentioning in my in the introduction, Memestetica, which will uh, be released in English in late summer or, or beginning of the fall. And this show was titled Eternal September, The Rise of Amateur Culture. And it was a, a group exhibition that kind of uh, wanted to explore uh, a very difficult topic, I mean, the, the relationship between professional art making and amateur cultural movements uh, online. And the idea was to try to compare images, aesthetic, discourses, and languages of these two worlds uh, that two worlds that from uh, what I could see at the time were slowly beginning to uh, blur, to communicate more with each other, and sometimes to even kind of merge. So this project marks a, a turning point in my curatorial approach in the field of digital uh, culture because it pushed me to abandon the, the, the safe walls of um, 
I mean, established and recognized art production and venture into the world of digital folklore and what I like to call uh, wild digital art that we can find online. So um, what brought me in this direction was this, a strong belief in the importance of uh, acknowledging um, social and cultural changes and of addressing them in the most honest way possible because um, I felt like it didn't make sense anymore uh, for me to keep making this, the same kind of exhibition that I used to do in the past in a completely mutated historical and cultural environment. I just could not like deal with the topic of digital culture, uh, just ignoring uh, that thing that the title of a show defines as the rise of amateur culture. So, and this is something I uh, um, still try to do today in my newer projects. And so, um, since I, I have only uh, a few minutes left, I believe, I'm going to uh, summarize my um, like set of guidelines. Uh, I'm trying to, okay, here it is. Uh, try to summarize like my, my personal set of guidelines, my do's and don'ts, which of course it's, uh, it's, it's a set of guidelines that is always changing and, and adjusting. Uh, but anyway, these are my guiding princi principles. I mean, the strategies that uh, enable me to like stop worrying too much about the hype and just confront it and rely, relying uh, so much more on the power of art making to like counterbalance these, uh, uh, the power and the, 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 the sensationalism that uh, uh, is, uh, um, I mean, behind the, con the mechanism of hype. Uh, let me see if I can, okay. So this is the list I'm going, I'm going to go through it very quickly. Uh, so the first, uh, and probably the most important uh, thing that I learned is that I don't have to give in to the temptation of reducing complexity because this is what hype does. Um, and it is a very common uh, misconception to think that the audience um, is not capable of understanding complex discourses. Uh, that's totally not true. Uh, and I speak from experience here. So you don't have to oversimplify uh, concept, uh, but what you need to do is pay attention to language because language is what should be uh, actually simple uh, because otherwise the risk is that you're like preaching to the choir which is not what i uh, i want actually want to do and also always in the field of language uh, i always tell i mean younger writers or curators to always avoid um, using tired metaphors like for example uh, software is uh, a new, the new brush or the net is like a canvas or we're living in a digital renaissance and so on. And these are also my uh, personal red flags when I read articles and press releases. Uh, so, and also what I try uh, not to do is to, uh, I try not to focus on technology itself, but on the effects that technology has on people's lives and another important don't is don't rely on the appeal of newness because that leads you to remain on the surface of things you have to come to with, i mean to come with an actual idea and not just rely on i mean on, on the appeal that the newness uh, carries with it and uh, um, related to the issue of newness that's the the, the the theme, the big topic of history. It's uh, really important to look at back at history. It is important to uh, contextualize change uh, in an historical framework. And not only because history, of course, uh, helps us to retrace the origin of things um, and understand cultural phenomena better, but also because uh, history offers us a, a, a list, uh, a long list of case studies that we can observe and is full of similar moments of change and moments of newness that we can learn from. So it's very important to connect uh, things in an historical context. Uh, and if possible, I always try to not work alone. Uh, it, it's very important to uh, assume a collaborative approach uh, to maintain the complexity. So I always try to talk with artists a lot and involve relevant communities share my thoughts with others and try to make 
uh, the curating project as collaborative as possible. And uh, uh, connected to this, uh, all in order to maintain the complexity of phenomena, it's also really important to adopt an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary approach. So use um, frameworks um, that are not only taken uh, from media studies or art theory, but also from uh, politics, economy, like science or philosophy, popular culture and so on. It's, it's for me, it's like the only way to make sense uh, of such big and complex uh, cultural changes. And uh, last but not least, I mean, the, the, the last two uh, uh, um, do's that I, was, I would like to suggest that probably they are the most important. The first one is to choose artworks and projects that question technology. Uh, and, and here I can maybe uh, connect with what, uh, what uh, um, Caroline Christoph was saying in the previous panel uh, uh, about skepticism uh, uh, when, when you're dealing with technology. Uh, for me, maybe I wouldn't use the, the word skepticism, but I uh, do uh, try to choose artworks that are uh, not just using technology and taking technology as it is, but that question technology and try to misuse it and to deconstruct it and to try to build uh, a discussion around it. So uh, in that sense, I really agree with the fact that the attitude towards technology is the most, impor the most important thing. And uh, the final um, guideline that I have is, uh, uh, I mean, this can be valid for all kinds of, of curating uh, cur projects. But I think that it's particularly important in, in the field that we are discussing today. And what I try to do is always uh, experiment hard and, and in a very brave way, also risking uh, failure. I experiment very hard with displays and formats. Uh, this kind of art sometimes is really difficult to fit into a white cube and just to fit in, into um, normal uh, uh, way the normal way that the most common way of showing art in, in, an, in an exhibition space uh, so i always suggest that uh, you, that that young curators try and break the rules if needed because this is like crucial to keep um, curating useful and a useful and relevant practice so i mean i i think that's it for for now and i'm looking forward to the discussion I'm taking notes of, as we go. Thank you so much. These are very good pointers, I think. Uh, excellent. And I can totally recognize them and, and, and describe them. So really happy that you so clearly laid this out. Uh, a very good foundation, I think. Um, I have one Thanks. question indeed, uh, as a sort of, you know, in segue into uh, the next presentation. And I'm really curious because you mentioned indeed, you said like uh, the criticality for you is important. And Caroline also mentioned indeed that skepticism, like you referred to as well. And you mentioned like, well, I wouldn't call it skepticism. Yeah. How do you see the difference between the two? Uh, because I, I maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but from my point of view, the word skepticism uh, implies that you are starting from like a negative point of view. And instead, I think that uh, the, the approach is more like uh, it, it's it would be better to describe it is uh, like um, um, being disrespectful uh, towards something, but in but also in a playful way. I mean, in in a in, in, in it can also be a positive approach. It doesn't uh, uh, have to be skeptical in the sense that you will come with biases and preconceptions. So I don't know if skeptical is the is the word I would use. But I get. I mean, I think we are we are on the same page. I think we are kind of saying of saying the same thing. Uh, I mean, not, not uh, accepting technological tools uh, as they come and, and try always to uh, uh, build discussion around them and and reflect on 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 the effects of technology on people, on society, and so on. And also uh, try also to maybe invent new ways of using technology and uh, propose different. Uh, uh, configurations for them, like different interfaces that we can use. Uh, like keep asking the question, what if things were different? That's, that's, mm -hmm. I think that that's the, the really relevant contribution that art is uh, kind of giving to the, the, the discussion on technological progress. 
That's great. I think that's really wonderful. Excellent. I think indeed it's something uh, that I noticed also within the previous uh, conversations, how important indeed language and terminology is and that we that there at least is some sort of understanding of what we talk about. Um, we'll con probably come back to that uh, in the discussion as well. The next presentation will be by Wade Wallerstein. And uh, Wade studied digital anthropology at UCL in London and has been very active the last couple of years as a curator and writer of digital arts. Uh, currently, he's based in California and his research centers around communication in virtual spaces and the relationship between visual culture and contemporary art. Next to all of this, he founded Silicon Valley, a virtual gallery and online exhibition space which also features uh, digital artists uh, residencies and he co-directs Transfer Gallery, a commercial gallery for uh, software-based computer digital arts in L in, uh, that is in LA together with uh, Kaleni Nicole. Uh, Wait, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And thank you again to Impact for inviting me. Um, I uh, am going to talk a little bit about what I think the stakes are in terms of that skepticism that uh, past presenters have been talking about and why I think uh, we need to rethink new strategies and techniques for dealing with these, these problems. Um, Today, there's really no thought or action that isn't defined by some kind of protocol, whether that protocol is written in code or enforced by the laws of physics. And for decades, thinkers have been exploring the effects of protocols, which are made manifest by hardware, software, and other digital technologies uh, on human cognition. But recently, a staggering global rise in disinformation, algorithms of oppression, and data surveillance technologies has helped facilitate this current era of hyper-reality. And we see this in algorithmic technologies that discriminate based on race, such as predictive criminology software, or even airport risk flagging systems. We see this also in the development of alt-right movements around the world and disinformation leading to skewed elections and rises in populism. And we also see this in the kind of sophisticated predictive marketing technologies that tell us what we want before we've had a chance to even think about it. Not only right now is it difficult to determine what is real and what isn't, but the difference is starting to lose meaning. We live in a semiotic society where anything that is presented as visible is beginning to be understood as true across continents and borders. And in this short talk, I'm gonna to try to think through some art historical and specifically anthropological lenses to help us describe how we got here and how we can think through this really complicated time. And this is still uh, a research pro pro project of mine in development, so it's not completely baked. And so I really appreciate you coming along with me on this journey as I try to think through how we can understand our networked world. So, you know, anyone, if you, if you read the news or participate on social media, you probably have a good impression of the kind of cognitive dissonance that has become a routine aspect of contemporary life in the Western world. What we read isn't always what we know to be true, and the mismatch of beliefs, value systems, and apparent evidence is starting to come to a head. Jean Baudrillard described this phenomenon as hyperreality, or our inability to tell the difference between reality and a simulation of reality. In our advanced technological society and with the advent of more complex social communication networks, what is real and what is fiction becomes blended together so that it is, it is nearly impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. And this is interesting because a number of thinkers have pointed out this sort of turns the binary between real and illusion on its head. And again, as I said, the difference is beginning to lose meaning. What does real even mean after all? In popular culture, this phenomenon was explored by the experimental documentarist Adam Curtis in his BBC film, Hypernormalization. And in his description of the film, Curtis writes that hypernormalization wades through the culmination of forces that have driven this culture into mass uncertainty, confusion, spectacle, and simulation. Where events keep happening that seem crazy, inexplicable, and out of control, this film shows a basis to not only why these chaotic events are happening, but also why we, as well as those in power, may not understand them. We have retreated into a simplified and often completely fake version of the world, and because it, because it is reflected all around us and ubiquitous, we accept it as normal. 
And I've been particularly struck by how these ideas represent currents in the world of visual arts, particularly in the recent rises in cryptocurrency and art object NFTs. Crypto has been lauded as the savior of the art world and the champion of the underrepresented artist, and creatives from all sectors are flocking to sites like Nifty Gateway Foundation and Hika Nuke um, to try to get a slice of the pie. Evangelism for this burgeoning technology is at an all-time high. We're even beginning to start seeing major brands join it to tell the world that you too can get rich quick by selling NFTs. And just a few weeks ago, for instance, NFT uh, Pepsi, the Pepsi soda company, announced an NFT launch, and we watched Facebook we watched Facebook slash Meta and Budweiser interact with them on Twitter. All of these corporate entities fully adopting and appropriating the language that the NFT the NFT community has developed to communicate with one another. Um, and I, but I want to take a step back because I think the art world has been, the art world and the anthropology world and the academic world has been adapting to the, these ideas about hyperreality for a while now. Um, and I like to center around a text by Seth Price, his work Dispersion, which is an iterative text that has been developed over many years and has come in many different forms and formats. Um, and what he says is that the problem arises when the constellation of critique, publicity, and discussion around a work of art is at least as charged as a primary experience of the work. Does one have an obligation to view the work firsthand? And what happens when a more intimate, thoughtful, and enduring understanding comes comes from mediated representations of an exhibition or an artwork rather than from a direct experience. And I think that's where these issues of hyperreality and the kind of uh, complexities of our current media environment start to play a role for curators. We have to deal with this uh, friction between creating reality and dealing with um, kind of the aftermath and the effects um, kind of on, on the other side. Um, and for me, as a curator uh, and an anthropologist, I have been really uh, a, a toolkit that I think is really useful for dealing with these problems is the concept of phenomenology. I mean, phenomenology is a, is a philosophical concept, um, but has kind of uh, made its way over to the world of social sciences. Um, and in um, and I think that it's really a, a critical tool that we have for dissecting the hyperreal. In his 1994 book, A Phenomenology of Landscape, Christopher Tilley explains how a phenomenological approach to thinking about landscapes particularly is vital in order to understand how people exist in the world and space. Phenomenology is a big word, but essentially what it does is reinscribe in space the relationship between the human body, agency, temporality, and social production. This is a perspective that culminates in the understanding and description of things as they are experienced by a subject. And defined by Tilly, phenomenology is the relationship between being and being in the world. So we can understand ourselves as experiencing everything through our senses, which we activate through techniques of our bodies. There's really no other way of understanding the world outside of what we experience. And importantly, this perspective applies across all spaces, places, and modes of being. Um, and I think that in our contemporary era, there is a lot of rhetoric about how the online isn't real. For instance, we hear all the time things like, what you see on Instagram isn't real, that's just fake. Um, but as many uh, material studies scholars have pointed out, uh, the online is just as real as the offline. And rather than opposing the virtual to the real, we need to oppose the virtual to the actual because both virtual spaces and actual spaces are real. Real things can happen there that affect us, how we think and how we go about our days. Um, and you know what we've kind of come to is this understanding that the material logic of digital systems have a profound impact on how they convey meaning to us. We can't dissociate technology from the information that carries and then going back to a phenomenological perspective, how our bodies experience that information. Um, and so um, I, 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 so, you know, where does that leave us now? Um, and, you know, we're kind of reaching this point in society where anything that we perceive or that we feel is becoming, is, is more real to us than anything that we perhaps know objectively to be true. Um, and where does that leave us? 
We know that as human beings, we are sensing agents who experience the world through our bodies. Phenomenology has a profound, if not the most profound impact on how we understand. And we see this in our hyper reality. When the phenomenology of the real and the simulated are identical, we understand what we feel to be the most sincere form of truth. We also know that protocols define and shape our world. Protocols are technological, political, social, and even physical or biological. We have to operate within them and we have to make meaning despite them. So I have a radical idea maybe. What if we could change those protocols? What if we could write our own? What if in building our own world, we could create new phenomenologies that offer new ways of meaning, feeling, understanding, and new ways of connecting with one another that cancel out, transform, or otherwise circumnavigate those damaging impacts of a society where reality is just what we see. If governments, corporations, and whatever powers that be can use phenomenology as a tool against the masses to control information and shape reality, then we can too. We, not, we might not be able to change certain technologies, but we can certainly repurpose them to fit our needs. So I'm calling for a new kind of protocol, a worlding protocol. In the face of looming environmental, social, and economic catastrophe, and this dizzying clash of techno-utopian and techno-fatalistic ontologies, there has to be a space outside that is not Western or even human-centric that we can look to. The concept of reworlding asks us to look at every aspect of our world, to look at the gray areas between competing ideologies and synthesize something new that works for all of us on an interspecies and intraplanetary level. And, you know, at the beginning of this talk, I spoke about how the difference between the real and the fake is continuing to lose meaning and might not even matter. But uh, in, a more, in a more positive turn, in the era of the hyper real, we make our reality. We choose what is real and what isn't, and we can use simulation to dream new possibilities and new pathways, and by doing so, wish them into existence. Um, I, I think that's about all that I, I have to say on this, and I hope that this was thought-provoking for everybody. Um, you know, we may live inside of a simulation, inside of a simulation, but we all have the power to make an impact on the system. Thank you so much. Well, I think that's the best segue into impact I've heard uh, today uh, as the festival is. Anyway, sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much. Very thought provoking indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm not sure whether you followed the beginning talks as well, because I know you're in a different time zone, right? Yeah, I unfortunately they were super early this morning and I, I sadly yeah. <laughs> missed them and I was hoping to and I was hoping to catch the recording. <laughs> Oh, that'd be really quick, yeah. Now, there was one thing that came up actually in the first uh, conversations that, that was quite interesting in, in a way that you talk now also about the different uh, communities. And um, in the first, I think, um, yeah, discussion, what really came up in a way was how there is less and less of a global feeling and that they felt like, okay, we're, we're moving more and more into subcultures and the more local than global. And Caroline just uh, actually said, well, I don't believe that really that is going on. And I'm really curious to hear your point of view. What, what do you see happening? Do you see in the, the, the dispersion of different subcultures or do you actually see a much more global um, universal uh, trend going well so i so i think to think about this we have to think about the algorithmic environments that we live in we live in an algorithmic reality where uh where uh lines of code determine what is visible to us and how we connect with other people and so in one sense i totally understand the nicheification, <laughs> if you will, uh, of different sub corners of the internet in the sense that people with like minded ideas and people who are sharing similar visual imagery and language, they get put together by these programs. Um, but at the same time, um, there is also a deeply homogenizing effect to these algorithmic environments in the sense that uh, in the sense that what is presented to you, the the kinds of materials that get promoted by the algorithm, the kinds of things that become visible, 
all fall under a certain rubric and we're starting to see uh, artwork from all over the world start to look similar. People using the same technologies, people relying on the same aesthetic tendencies. Um, there's a lot of talk, particularly in the NFT space, about this kind of shiny rotating render aesthetic that has really become per, uh, has really permeated. So I think that the answer is kind of somewhere in the middle. We're seeing both. We're seeing both the homogenization of people from all of these niche subcultures on the world getting connected to each other and then growing larger and becoming something bigger. We also see kind of contemporary visual culture converging around whatever the aesthetics of the algorithm determine to be most popular. Um, and I think within that, some of the most radical work is the work being done by groups that are resisting um, the kind of uh, flattening effect of those algorithmic spaces. Um, I hope that that uh, answers your question. Definitely, definitely. And I'm, I'm sure we'll follow up uh, soon uh, in the discussion as well. Now to our third and last speaker for today, Doreen Rios. Uh, she's an independent curator and researcher who in her work focuses on digital art, post-digital practices and hybrid materialities more generally. All reflected also in her website, Anti Materia, which is a, a, a platform dedicated to the research and exhibition of Latin American digital art. In one of her latest projects, she returns to the rise of the internet in Mexico, where she's from, through a series of cyber protests fueled by the Zapatista Army of National Liberation in the late 90s to bring back the discourses and practices of tactical media and hacktivism, uh, perhaps also today. I'm looking forward to you, Doreen. Please take the floor. We're not hearing you yet. I'm not hearing you yet. I'm not sure that's you or it's us or impact. I have to say, I'm not us. Let me see if I can see something appearing in my chat. What's going on? Do you have your, you're muted and everything. Mm. It may be a re quick restart could do it. Ah, here Ayan comes. Yeah, hi Annette and hi Doreen. Um, we're trying hard to fix the problem here. It's probably uh, an issue at our end. So we managed to solve it uh, in the previous panel uh, pretty quick. So my hopes are high. Let's just uh, have some patience. The visuals are excellent uh, from Doreen. So that's uh, not the problem. <laughs> now we have to fix the audio. Actually, you look so much closer by from Mexico than Annette does from Amsterdam, but that might be uh, <laughs> your webcam. Um, so, um, oh yeah, um, uh, could you refresh, Doreen, could you refresh? That might solve the problem. It must be the storm that's bothering my vision here. Oh, yeah. We had a hefty storm yesterday, that's true. Okay, you're back, Doreen. Yeah, can now I can hear you. Hear me yeah. Now? Yeah. yeah, just oh, go ahead. Awesome. Great. Perfect. Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, well, for this particular talk, I, I decided to go for a specific project that I've been working on for the past two and a half years or so. Um, and I guess it sort of ties really well with what Valentina was uh sharing with us and also with what Wade was sharing with us in regards to how we are understanding the possibilities of the internet, but also critically looking into what's going on within all of these protocols and how do we as users uh, mainly can fit and intervene within all of these protocols. So, um, well, yeah, generally speaking, my, uh, my practice uh, is very much tied to research and to uh, curatorial practices looking into digital art uh, particularly and what we're looking at uh, here in this video uh, pre-recorded video is the last exhibition that i uh, curated it opened last year um, around uh, mid-november uh, it's an online show you can uh, go into into it <laughs> at, at any time and until the last days of march and it is an exhibition uh, that's called Cuánto tiempo lleva todo esto derramándose sin desbordarse. So 
that in English is something like how much time has all of these been spilling out without overflowing? And I think it sort of talks in a, in a very close way to the possibilities of thinking about the internet in a non, um, say non-traditional way in regarding both uh, aesthetics, but also discourses. So, well, this exhibition looks into Ricardo Dominguez's work and it's a retro collective effort of um, kind of like finding a series of, of activations and artworks that he had been working on, particularly through other collectives. Um, so he had been working in the past with Critical Art Ensemble, with Electronic Disturbance Theater, with Particle Group, with the UC Center for Drone Ethics and Politics. Um, and pretty much all of his work has always been tied somewhere in between hacktivism, performance, poetry, text, and the internet as a, as a broader scenario. And I find this very interesting to put into the conversation because this is probably one of the first uh, artists and collective actions that I, um, that I can think of or identify within uh, the Mexican context, but also within the very, um, I don't know, like the very early development of the internet, locally speaking. So in order to talk about this, I would say that, um, well, what we're looking at is mainly the, the recovery of two artworks. One of them is Plotnet, which is at uh, the moment on screen, which is an, an online protest, a uh, work of hacktivism, which, was, which took the shape of a Java applet that allowed you to um, put messages into um, different websites. Some of these websites were uh, some banks, some Mexican banks. Others were, uh, well, the website of the Pentagon and the Frankfurt, Frankfurt Stock Market as well, and the Mexican president, uh, which back then was Ernesto Cedillo. This was a, yes, a collective action, a virtual sit-in. It was uh, something that uh, in a way happened within a political context uh, that required international visibility for certain matters to be put into the uh, local political conversation in Mexico, particularly regarding a very awful moment in time uh, where a genocide was perpetrated by a military group. Um, a, this uh, particular uh, group uh, attacked uh, a community in, in Chiapas and that were um, allies of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. So generally speaking, the Zapatista army is also one of the, I would say, one of the key areas of conversation that I have had uh, in the past, in this research, but also in the past years in regards to tactical media in Mexico, because the SZLN or the Zapatista uh, Army of National Liberation, from the very, very beginnings of the internet, say the early, very, very early 90s, they understood that the only way they could uh, surpass the local censorship and particularly the way in which um, mass media in Mexico was completely tied to political uh, to political powers was through uh, the diversification of the ways in which they distributed information. So this particular artwork we are looking at right here, I think it looks very closely and tries to understand, yes, the internet as a as a way of distributing information that could not be safely distributed otherwise, of course, in the in this case, in the late 90s, but then also that is looking into other ways of having this radical collectiveness uh, popping up in other areas that might not necessarily uh, feel tied to a geographical spot. Of course, uh, the way in which this particular artwork and pretty much all of Ricardo Dominguez's work with Electronic Disturbance Theater mainly looks into the internet is, yes, into the possibilities of this very early internet. So, well, I was doing the research for this exhibition, particularly, I think one of the main questions that I started asking myself while developing this was, well, and how can we understand that right now? How do we see that happening? Is this something that keeps on popping up into a conversation? Is tactical media something that is, you know, active out there? Are there any ways of going outside of this techno patriarchy that doesn't allow for any kind of conversation that is not uh, looking into, let's say, or, or, or in a way working towards fueling more views and more data and more likes and more, et cetera, et cetera. 
especially when we think about uh, the web 2.0 right like after uh, the rise of social media and the i don't know in a way the loss of understanding how to navigate the internet outside of social media and uh, this is a question that kept on popping up um, both on the research and on the conversations that i had with ricardo dominguez while i was doing this research but also with my younger students um, so i also lecture at, uh, at a couple of universities here in mexico city and one of the of my lectures is pretty much about transmedia strategies so not necessarily only for art but you know thinking about channels of communication uh, through digital devices or digital platforms and this is a question that I, I normally ask uh, when we start working and looking into these kind of projects and it very much is like well do you feel that you know how uh, that you feel that you know how that you know how to navigate the internet do you feel like you're comfortable navigating the internet do you know what that means and of course the first uh, impulse of my students would be to say of course I mean the internet all day every day in various devices right and I perfectly know how it works and how it looks like and how I can uh, move from side to side and then we start exploring the question of okay how would you normally use the internet how would you normally find something on the internet um, and then they realize that normally what we do or what they do in this case is to go into social media and from social media jump outside into let's say the broader internet and when we kept on thinking about that kind of protocol and this process of interaction with the internet in itself we realized that of course it feels as if we were sort of kidnapped by well mainly three big uh, companies at least uh, uh, on this side of the world right like we are always somewhere in between google facebook meta whatever or amazon and we are always kind of like just tapping in between those notes and reconnecting from one another and we are just navigating these filter bubbles that have been created for ourselves to feel comfortable in or to trigger certain emotions or to trigger certain actions and when i try to connect that back to these tactical media exercises of the late 90s and early 2000s that were popping up and happening within uh, mexico and expanding into mainly the us I just kept on thinking you know like how how can we go back into that how do we understand these what are the key concepts or the key ideas that can help us jump outside of this hype bubble but also jump outside of the ways in which we think we can interact and behave and create and curate and whatever online especially after 2020 right like after this forced digitization of everything and uh, and the ways in which the discourses the words that have been in a way weaving together and sometimes it just doesn't make sense um so here the invitation within all of these uh, conversation and especially from within my students but also from within some of the reviews that we had um after this exhibition was launched uh which uh, well also sadly is uh, only available in uh, in spanish generally speaking but if you go into the artworks plotnet and transporter immigrant tool um, both of them have uh, the option of being seen in English. So, well, I should. I think that could help <laughs> a tiny bit, <laughs> hopefully. And um, well, reconnecting with the question of this panel, but also reconnecting, reconnecting with this question of how can we look into other ways of making a space for critical conversations, but also for activating something else from within these, yes, techno patriarchy uh, devices and platforms um i kept on going back into the notion of the strategy and the tactic so when i started exploring the notion of tactical media um to be absolutely honest uh, when i first started writing about it i i realized that i kept on using tactic and strategy as if they were synonyms of one another uh, but they very much aren't and there's a really really key area of conversation there that allows for other possibilities in the differences between these two concepts right so when we think about a tactic when you we think about something that behaves in a tactical way or that appears and pops up in a tactical way normally we're looking into something that is understanding the whole context and the whole composition of a space of an idea of a discourse of an event and taking that uh, into account for 
um, in a way, advancing some ideas or being able to play some ideas that, that wouldn't normally go or fit into these events, platforms, or devices. So the tactical action normally tries to look into something that allows for a possibility that might be unique to this moment in time. And the tactical side of it, it also doesn't feel as if they um, would need or require to reestablish, repurpose, or rethink a system because the system shouldn't be put into place in the first place, shouldn't be needed in the first place. Whereas when we think about the strategic uh, side of it or the strategy, generally speaking, normally we're looking into something that requires readjusting a system or reshaping a system, uh, something that we might feel, say, quote unquote, <laughs> something that is updated for the best, right? And that is something that we see keep on popping up in pretty much every technological device or technological uh, innovation platform and so forth. What we see is we need to make the current system a better system instead of thinking about why do we need this system at all. So I think the proposal in here, the I don't know, uh, the, the key question towards well all of the tactical media work that Ricardo Dominguez has been doing, but of course into a lot of other conversations that have been popping up out there in the screen and outside the screen is very much about wondering is not uh, to think or maybe the invitation would be not to think how should we propose to change this particular system or this current broken of course and precarious system for the better it's about removing the need for this system altogether and um, and i mean this is of course a provocation that i would like to put into the conversation afterward. But I think that uh, if we were trying to think critically on how to curate online, create online, behave online, interact and exchange online, we should be thinking about the fact that we shouldn't be perpetuating a system that is not looking and caring for us. And, uh, and I know that this question of who is we, who is us, is super complex and it has been popping up in previous conversations. And I'm happy to just bring that back to the table. Um, however, broadly speaking, it is definitely something in between these systems that should be definitely just, I know, like exploding from the inside. And the only way to do that, I think, is to rethink the need for those systems in the first place. And perhaps the only way we can do that under the current circumstances is thinking tactically about what we can do and how we can fit certain discourse discourses from within it. So yeah, well, that's that's me. <laughs> that's <laughs> where I should end up. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, a wonderful project that you're working on, uh, very, very relevant uh, still today, I think, as well. Uh, talking about today and, and the tactical, uh, I was wondering, do you have any examples that you see today that resemble that sort of tactics that tactical media was also using? Yeah, I can think of at least three projects that are happening in Mexico. So one of them is uh, this project by Dora Bartilotti uh, that's called, uh, well, uh, No Voy Sola. And, uh, and she has all of these like very intense practice of putting the stories of uh, gender violence out there and trying to keep a series of uh, circles of care, that's how she names them, um, via working textiles and developing electronic textiles to go outside on streets and protest basically wearing the voices of uh, multiple women who have been uh, well who have faced uh, gender violence and who decided to go to share their stories um, anonymously so she in a way embodies that through yes a series of technological devices but that are being weaved and developed through circles of care i think dora is doing a fantastic work on that matter uh, there is also leonardo aranda leonardo aranda also works um, somewhere in between uh, online based projects and projects that also jump outside of the screen. He has a project that's called El Monumento para los Desaparecidos, so the, the monument for the disappeared ones. That's also sadly, uh, uh, well, a very you know, hard reality in Mexico. A lot of people who just disappear because of uh, 
their political stance because of their gender, because of the ideologies that they have. And what he builds is a series of um, devices online that where you can record your voice naming someone that has disappeared. Sometimes that pops up into public space as well. Sometimes that is, you know, just something that keeps on adding up into this server that in a way also embodies the voices of people that are not currently here or that we just don't know where they are at. Um, those are two breaks that I find very, very potent, um, particularly within well, the local context. And I also think a lot about all of these, I don't know, like activations and conversations that might be wider spread, such as, of course, like she was also mentioned, I think, in a, in a previous conversation, the Legacy Russell and the Glitch uh, Feminist Manifesto. I think that that is also an invitation for finding ourselves in by refusing to work for the system or by, you know, acknowledging the error as something that needs to be, um, well, in a way, visible over and over and over. I think, um, well, at least those are three examples of, of this kind of tactical media um, appearing in, in contemporary, very contemporary <laughs> scenarios. Mm. No, that, that's very encouraging. So there is still a lot of hope, I think, indeed, to overcome the system that's in place. I'd like to invite also the other speakers, uh, Veit and Valentina. And in the meantime, there was a comment indeed in the in the chat uh, that says also by Edith Doron that the tactical indeed could also be seen as the parkour, a tactical response for or against the design strategy of inner, inner city urban housing planning, which again, I think is indeed a very good example also of that sort of tactical Absolutely. movement performance in public space, which is very interesting indeed as well. So here we are. Thank you all very much uh, for your fantastic presentations and, and insights in your work practices and how you see things developing uh, within this technology world. I have a lot of questions, actually, and um, uh, one of them, uh, in a way, is, is very much about um, some of the yeah the tactics uh, potentially indeed were mentioned already right on, on how to subvert and how to take over uh, the ways of doing and um one of the things uh, valentina that you mentioned was like the wild digital uh, the digital frontier the wild frontier in a way right um would you also say that it's about like curating in the wild it was an expression that was uh, came up with a colleague of mine who mentioned it all of a sudden it's like well it's like online curating is something like curating in the wild i mean how do you all kind of relate to that let's see who gets the the sound first because i'm not hearing anything yet <laughs> yeah valentina i think you're muted And we're not hearing Doreen either anymore. Oh no, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, that's Maybe so if weird. you start, okay. then we can wait for the others to reappear again. Let's see if the backend um, can solve that. Yeah, um, so yeah, I can definitely talk about this really quickly while um, we get the audio started for the other two. Um, curating in the wild is something that has actually really been a key part of my research practice recently. I've been working with a group of curators who are loosely operating under the moniker of Crisis Core. And this is kind of a temporary name that we've developed through many conversations with the community um, to kind of be a placeholder to describe this practice that's happening now. And basically what Crisis Core is, it's a group, there's a, it's a decentralized group of curators and uh, art outlets that operate entirely online. Um, but basically they take sculpture and they take images and they work remotely and they send each other files and the curator will take the files or take the, sh the sculpture that was mailed to them and take it out into the natural world and pose the sculptures in, uh, for instance, uh, in the salt marshes in Utah, in the case of the gallery Final Hot Desert, um, or in um, an abandoned industrial waste site, as in the case of Underground Flower in London. Um, and they then image, photograph these uh, physical installations and then repost them online. And the ultimate result is something that is never experienced physically, even though the work itself is physical and it becomes this kind of like hybrid post-photographic practice. And to me, that's the that's like the 
that is like the most curating in the wild that <laughs> I think you can I, I that yeah. you can get right now. Um, just going out into the world, putting the work there, and then creating this kind of separate representation that um, either breaks or fits into or mm -hmm. somehow subverts uh, the algorithmic space that it will ultimately be be experienced in. Mm -hmm. Great. In the meantime, I did hear someone. So whoever shouts first. Ah, no. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> My sign language is not good enough, I'm afraid. <laughs> Can we have any help from the back end? Can you hear me? Yep. Ah, yeah, super. Again, uh, Manon is on it, trying to fix the problem. Uh, wait, your audio was perfect. And let's uh, try and get uh, Doreen and Valentina also in. And um, um, could you uh, refresh, restart, like uh, like uh, Doreen, you've done before, I think. That's probably uh, what does the trick. Someone was audible. Could uh, Valentina, could you say uh, something? Yeah, I, we've got I audio from you. Oh, Excellent. Okay. Doreen? Yeah. Doreen also, yeah. I think. So let's yes, just go ahead. I think you all have sound now. Go ahead. Refreshing always Thank works. You. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, do you want to go on again? It's, yeah. it's always the best strategy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Should I should I go now? Yeah, yes. please. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. Um, the idea of curating in the wild uh, for me has two different meanings. The first one is related to something similar to what uh, Wade was mentioning. So it's about the approach uh, that you have and about the, I mean, being aware of the fact that the internet, it is a wild place in, in the most profound sense of the word. It, it, it is a, a, a forum, it's a place where uh, content is not, uh, I mean, it's not archived in the traditional sense of the word, it's not organized and, and there is, you are working inside, um, uh, a place where context uh, has collapsed completely. So you have to make sense of things. You have to uh, retrace the origin of things. And, and, and so uh, it is like, I mean, the, the, the metaphor of the, of the wilderness, I think it's, it's very fitting to the actual work you do, I mean, day by day, uh, working with digital culture. And this is the first, um, I mean, meaning of uh, these uh, words for me. But the second one is also, uh, for me, also connected to a particular um, theory concept that I found and that I uh, mentioned in the book, in, my, in the Memesthetica book. And the concept is not, I mean, I, I didn't coin it myself. Uh, it's a very interesting definition, and it's by a Canadian uh, theorist named Darren Werschler. And, the con and he coined this very interesting definition that it's conceptualism in the wild. And uh, he uh, wrote about this thing uh, for the first time, like 10 years ago. Uh, and the article was about um, conceptual writing. Uh, he's uh, um, uh, a literature scholar, so he's, most in, he's, in, he's not into visual art. He is a researcher in the field of uh, poetry, literature, and especially experimental literature. And so he uh, wrote this article in, in which he coined this uh, interesting definition. So conceptualism in, this, in the wild is basically when you uh, go around the internet and you find examples of things that, and, and, and particular uh, uh, content that uh, is uh, um, connected in some way to the tradition of conceptual art. In, in, in different uh, in different ways, so you see gestures, um, projects, and, and and text, and 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 also uh, performances online that, uh, seen from an historical point of view, uh, are really really similar to uh, some kinds of tactics and strategies and languages that we tend to associate with with contemporary art, with a particular field of contemporary, which is conceptual art. So uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I I took this, uh, I borrowed this, uh, uh, I mean, interesting definition in the book, and I dedicate, a, a, I mean, a, um, um, a big part of the book uh, to the analysis of this phenomenon uh, in the visual art uh, field. And so for me, this idea of wild digital art is also connected to the fact that we find a lot of of interesting projects and actions and performances, especially in the world that we normally 
uh, associate with the world of memetics and, and viral images and uh, meme languages in general, memetic images and so on. So in that field, I find that there is a lot of, uh, con of, 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 of conceptual art going on that it's totally wild, meaning that there is uh, most of the time these authors are not really um, aware of the tradition they are stepping in, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. they are using similar kind of languages, a similar kind of actions. So th this idea of the wild in, in my research has these two different meanings. I guess I, um, when I think about like curating in the wilderness, I, sort of it always brings me back to a video project by Alan Warburton. That's the Goodbye yeah. Uncanny Valley from 2017. And he tries to outline uh, yeah. the let's say digital production, particularly looking into 3D modeling and the ways in which this uh, production sits. And one of them is the what happens in the wild. No? And uh, yeah. and I think a lot about uh, also what what Wei was was saying in regards to uh, Final Desert. I think that what they do is absolutely brilliant as well. And also I think you know somehow I think that when we think about digital practices and particularly online practices, we tend to have this notion that is something that can only happen within a screen that is located on an interior or something that needs to be seen like in a very one-on-one -on -one way and you need to have like proper connection and it's something that's going to run, sl uh, run slow if it's not uh, you know kind of like developed for that and, um, and I mean looking into into this particular idea I think that building a sense of I don't know like formulating a way of developing an online exhibition or a project that looks into curatorial practice dealing with online practices, generally speaking, um, I don't think it necessarily has to do with something that you can follow up as a list of steps that you're going to just, you know, do one and two and three and five times and it's going to work properly each time. And, um, and I say this because, well, in, in my very own experience curating uh, online-based art, I think that the most compelling outcomes have always been the ones that in a way have invaded the space outside the screen, which is not necessarily to say that it's something that pops up as like, you know, let's just play some computers out there and let people navigate it because we all know that that is not necessarily going to work under all of the contexts. But uh, what happens when you when you show this artwork in such a way that you go into the places where people are already at. And it looks also into this notion of the wilderness, right? Um, so I remember a couple of projects. One of them was with my well, former students of mine. They were doing the VA in animation and digital art. And uh, my lecture was about curation. And, uh, and in the end, the, the university, which I'm not going to name, uh, <laughs> they didn't uh, allow us to have a proper space for the final exhibition to happen because they were like, well, this is online, right? Like, you do not have, you do not need any space. You only have to pop that like into some social media or whatever, and that's fine. So what we did is that we built, um, well, it was a bicycle where we added a car battery on top of it, and we basically just tie the projector to it and we had all of the works being shown from a small raspberry pi and we were like a bunch of students and myself just like cycling down the roads projecting that into the walls we never asked for permission for anything we didn't ask anyone for anything I and mean, we're just like you know some people there with a projector doing stuff on the streets but i think that was absolutely much more successful because we did have people coming over and saying like, oh, well, what is all of this? Like, what's, what's that? What am I looking at? Why are you doing this? Who are you? Uh, that kind of like started other conversations in regards to the content of the artworks or to the proposal, say, generally speaking, of deciding to go outside, take the bicycle and just kind of like do whatever felt right of doing outside. Um, and we kept on thinking, well, probably we we had a lot more audience here outside very literally going on the streets um, and having to have this one-on-one -on -one mediation with the audience uh, rather than having these being shown on the gallery space and the university where probably you would need you know you would always be fighting to get more devices in order to get 
you know, proper space for each artwork to appear. It was also a very big group. We were like 30 students. So, you know, um, and I kept on thinking a lot about that because that that is a review that one of the parents of my students uh, had, you know, they, they were like, oh, well, you just decided to go into the wild, right? Like you just decided to take all of these, you know, put it on top of a bicycle and see what happened. And And I think that somehow, Probably by the early 2000s, I feel like maybe working within online exhibitions felt a little bit like that, right? Like, let's just place this into the wild and see what happens and see who comes across of the, uh, you know, the, the exhibition and the reviews that they might have, the ideas that this might trigger. And actually allowing for this, for the decision of saying, you know, whoever is looking into this the, gets to decide what they are looking at. There is no one else who names that for you. And, and I think that that is something very powerful. And I and I remember well, this very small kid who was looking into the projections on the street and he was like, this is like crazy cinema, like cinema outside of the cinema. Like, I, And he didn't know how to name it. And I really like that because you find your own way of thinking about it. And maybe, you know, for, perhaps nowadays, Running wild into you know outside of social media or taking the screen outside of the interior space might be the next I don't know like or the current step or the recent step of like actually not only moving from within the notions of wilderness in the curatorial the curatorial discourse and art production but also very literally outside of the protocols that are normally set for this. So I, I yeah. think this actually. It's really nice uh, also in relation to what Wade was telling indeed about the, the real and the not real in a sense, right? And how the virtual and the real uh, are colliding, you know, there is not really that strong of a distinction be to be made anymore. Um, I want to go because there's little time, uh, unfortunately, but there are some uh, good in questions also coming from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to read one out, a question from Alora. Um, I thought it was interesting, and she refers to Caroline's uh, lecture before, that she made a point about the explosion of the digital correlating with need to stupefy or numb ourselves in response to the main, uh, to, to the pain, i sorry, of COVID and uh, other environmental or political disasters, hyperproliferation or Netflix content during the pandemic, etc. Her question is, as a curator of critical spaces, do you have any strategies for avoiding that kind of psychic numbing, the catatonia association we may have with uh, digital formats, or do you see it as something to embrace? Um, it's a question for any of you, so anyone who feels that they'd like to answer that, please go ahead. I'm, I, I'm not sure I catch the entire question. Um, um, I didn't catch the part about the strategies for what? Yeah, Sorry. it's looking for if uh, indeed, if the, is, as a curator of a critical digital space, yeah. do you have strategies for avoiding the kind of psychic numbing that may oh, happen okay. in digital formats like Netflix, etc.? Or do you see that actually as something to embrace? Okay, I have a great, I have an answer. Oh, sorry, Valentina, you go first. No, no, you go. If you, I feel that you have a great, a great answer. I have, I think about this a lot, actually. Um, so that's a great question, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, I am very inspired right now by artists who are and this kind of connects to what we were talking about, about curating in the wild. Um, I'm very inspired by artists who are going to the commons, going to the public virtual spaces and repurposing them. Um, and I think a really great example of someone who does this is La Turbo Avedon, um, who a few years ago worked with Manchester International Festival to do an installation in Fortnite. Um, and Fortnite is a massively multiplayer online game um, with a it with a billions and billions of dollar virtual currency and digital asset trading economy that's played by millions of players around the world, a lot of kids. Um, and they recently launched a sandbox mode where 
players can go and they can build their own levels, build their own worlds. And Laturbo went into this game and built an entire installation and an experience that was really rich and beautiful. And it ended up being visited by, um, I think, something like three or four million players. And I could create the biggest show ever at the largest museum in the world, and I would never get that many pairs of eyeballs on the show. And so there was something to be said about going to this place, which is corporate, run by a massive game company um, that is super popular and very prescribed, where there's certain socially accepted ways of performing within this virtual space, and turning that upside down, resisting the numbing, and creating something that makes the player who's really used to this environment and maybe even native there uh, to reconsider what the space is around them. Um, and enter something that leaves game space and enters into an art space while they both kind of collide at the same time. Um, and I think that was a really valuable exercise in kind of avoiding the numbing that we can have. You know, if you if anybody plays um, first person shooter games, it's really rhythmic. It kind of there's almost like a hypnotic element to the rhythm of playing that kind of even levels out your 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 cognitive state. Um, and this totally upended that. Um, and kind of just to 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 speak to that just a little bit more, also in talking about Laturbo Avedon's work, um, they've been describing lately um, a concept called EXO. Um, and we've been kind of enmeshed in conversations about the metaverse recently. Um, but the metaverse is really a centralized thing that's controlled by a few corporations, um, most, you know, most prominently meta. Um, but the concept of EXO is the opposite. EXO is a protocol for decentralized simulation that is not controlled by one corporation or even a small group of people, but is a protocol by which any uh, visual creative can use these uh, simulation techniques in a decentralized centralized manner all using their own autonomous servers or bandwidth or whatever else you know you might have and I think that by thinking through these things these are tactics that we can use to avoid the numbing avoid the homogenization that we're starting to see in virtual spaces um, and you know offer something that continues to hold the independent um, artist uh, uh, you know in high regard And well, I mean, this is this comes from a different area of, um, you know, of what we were talking about earlier. But uh, the last three years, I have been working on developing the online um, online exhibitions platform for the Digital Culture Center here in Mexico City uh, with my colleague and friend Canek Zapata. And we launched that on 2020, but that's something that we have been trying to push like way before that, but it wasn't something that felt um, as important before 2020. So that's also a conversation to be had there, right? Um, and when we started developing like the internal policies, since no one really had a clue of what that meant, what we decided was to go for having exhibitions that opened and also closed. And when they close, we would only have the documentation of these available. And that is something that at first didn't make sense for the institution. Of course, they were like, well, but it's online. We can just have everything going on there. And we're like, I mean, yes, we could. But at the same time, it, it, could, it will eventually become a dead archive. And dead archives have very uh, heavy ecological impacts, right? And also in terms of the, resources of, of the resources of the people who have to keep on updating and restoring all of this for, for it to be available. And if you do not have a proper communication strategy or even an intention for this to actually be kept there, there is no reason for us to keep it going, right? And that's something that even well for us didn't really feel very radical or anything but it felt like for the institution it was something that was very hard to to just put the finger on they were like no but it's digital let's just keep it there forever and ever you know this notion of like well the internet is just going to be there and once it's up they uh, uploaded you cannot remove it from there and you know all of these like i don't know utopian fictions from the early 90s basically and we're like well no the, we do not have the resources nor the time, nor the funding for doing this. And also, I think that that is like one of the decisions that you need to make in order for it to make sense to what you're trying to build as a conversation as a whole. So even if it was something that at first was very problematic, I think that right now 
we are more interested in thinking about the proper documentation practices for this to be in a way archived for the future without necessarily having to you know keep on this loop of the eternal update of stuff because i think that there you can have like all of these not not only the numbing of processes but also like all of this impact that goes way beyond the artwork and way beyond the website and way beyond the curators and way beyond a lot of things and that once it spills out of your hands and you have no control over it it only becomes you know something that is there because of no one really knows why right like this is not a collection and this is not an archive as, as such so if we're gonna have like a proper goal and policy for this to happen this is something that should be in the conversation and i think that there is not enough conversations in regards to these, particularly in digital online-based practices. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the risk also is that you like collect digital ruins around <laughs> during the years. <laughs> I see it happen a lot of the time, a lot of times because uh, maintenance is such a big issue. And so if you have, you just keep websites online and, and don't care for them, you just keep, trashing <laughs> collecting trash around and and things get uh, i mean they get obsolete softwares get obsolete and the viewing experience is not what what it was meant to be and, and it's not it's not useful so it's yeah i'm totally with you on that and um also maybe um something that i have been experimenting uh, during the past year is to um abandon uh, the the concept of um, building like um, a proper uh, i don't know how to call it like a proper uh, box for the content a proper container uh, meaning that for example i made like a, an instagram filter exhibition last year and we decided to just release the filters in the wild without making without giving them any kind of container that could set them apart from the other filters we just commissioned filters to uh, uh, some artists that I, I i selected and we just published the the, the filters on uh, on the on the profile of the magazine which i was working for at the time but we didn't we, we decided to uh, i mean there was a big discussion uh, about that we decided not to make a, a website for the show not to not to give them any kind of uh, stable container so just release these things in the wild of the uh, incredibly chaotic and diverse world of instagram filters without like giving them any kind and that's and it was an i think an interesting experiment we, because in a similar way to the other experience you were mentioning people just bump into these uh, filters that are made by artists so they are kind of supposed to be artworks uh, but they experience them in a totally uh, free way without any kind of uh, i mean uh, caption or explanation or and without even that i mean the awareness that that was meant to be an art project and so i'm also trying to experiment with this idea of not having a container for things mm. i really like that idea i think that's a wonderful uh, strategy to take indeed a wonderful tactic perhaps even better than a strategy mm. yeah. um, there's an, another question in the in the chat for um uh, for Wade, and I think it kind of nicely connects because you might be able to help us out here as well. Um, Kimberly asks, how has the study of anthropology actually influenced or nuanced your curatorial practice? Oh, I love this question. This is a great one. Um, so, you know, I w studied art history and media studies in, in my undergraduate, and I went on to do an advanced degree in anthropology because I felt like art history didn't provide me the toolkit that I needed at the time to understand visual culture in the way that I was thinking about it. Um, anthropology is a little bit more, the anthropology is less concerned with how the art is made or even how technically skilled or even necessarily the history around it. And it's way more concerned in what that work is currently doing in society. 
um, and what its effects are. Um, and you know, that's what I was curious about. I wanted to understand how um, I could use curation as a way to explore current trends in visual culture and try to dissect what's going on um, in our world. Um, and it's ultimately helped me to have a richer, deeper understanding of the artists that I've I've worked with. Um, you know, phenomenology is just one um, is just one lens that I, I've I've been able to take from anthropology. Um, but there's certainly many, many others. Um, I think that, for instance. Um, conversations. Um, for instance, Eduardo de Viveros Castro's idea of the ontological turn um, and difference and alterity between people and experience um, has also been really influential in me um, for how I think about the artists and the artworks that I'm working with. Um, so yeah, I hope that I hope that answers your, your but I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, too, I think that we're all anthropologists. And I think that, you know, we just don't think about ourselves these ways all curators are they're thinking about people and they're thinking about how art works affect people um, and what that means for our culture more broadly. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways we use these tools, but we don't name them as such. Um, and so I'm sure that, you know, Valentina and Doreen probably have somewhat similar experiences in, in trying to think through the effects of image culture um, on us as people. It also nicely ties in, in a way, in, in, in a question that was posed earlier uh, about cultural memory. And, and clearly, while cultural memory is, you know, is very specific and subjective in many ways, uh, I think it is also a nice lens, indeed, to look at these issues that we just that you just mentioned now, both from a sort of anthropological point of view, but also from a sort of more maybe even media archaeology, sort of digital media archaeology kind of point of view. Well, how do we actually deal with this, you know, uh, stuff around us that's not going to be around long and will disappear before we know it. And how can we find new ways of, uh, yeah, still remembering those things? And uh, the idea of unboxing them, I think, is very interesting to, to move away indeed from the sort of archival issue of always uh, standardizing everything and just uh, letting it evolve in, in different uh, worlds and different ways, I think, would be really productive in that sense. I'm afraid uh, we've run way out of time and uh, we, we have to close it. I want to thank you all again very, very much. And I do hope we can continue the discussion sometime, somewhere, someplace. Uh, if it's online or offline, it doesn't matter, uh, as long as it happens. Uh, thank you all very much. And um, Arion will be coming in uh, to have a final word uh, about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Wade and Doreen and Valentina, uh, great having you. And uh, Annette, thanks a lot for moderating this session. Uh, is there anything, I mean, you did look back, of course, and reflect on, on what was said a lot, but is there anything that you especially take away from the overall panel that you just moderated? Yeah, now for me that was, and I've made some notes in this, uh, because I knew this was coming. And um, there are some takeaways, I think, that are really important. And that are specific perhaps to this uh, panel, but also go indeed into the other panels as well. And one of them is sort of like language is important, right? Uh, language is and that connects to identities, cultures, social and economic context. Um, but it also relates to education, I think. Um, if there's no history or better even multiple histories, it's hard to build and actually have a very productive uh, dialogue. And it's also about to move beyond the standards mode of using technology and the web and algorithms more generally. It's, it's really pushing for not only making systems better, but more likely just subverting them and uh, also just looking into new systems and building your own. It's moving uh, beyond what is indeed the standard and the universal ideas about that. So it also asks, what if by reimagining and acting, uh, uh, but uh, by, sorry, by asking what if and uh, by reimagining, but also by acting as if it's something already happened and thus creating a new world uh, for yourselves. In your little subculture, uh, but that also links to a more um, global and, and common, uh, common world. I think that was also one of the outcomes. I think that was interesting to see how subcultures actually evolve and come together again in different ways. So yeah. very interesting. Of mm -hmm. yeah. fruit. Sorry? 
a lot of uh, food mm -hmm. for thought. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, I, I, I did like Valentina's rule book, although I'm sure she wouldn't call it a rule book, but the, like the interesting do's and don'ts, and many of them, I think, uh, um, are definitely worth considering when dealing with uh, art in general. Um, the curating in the wild, I think, was a great idea. Maybe that brings us to the question, how do we keep this internet wild? Um, I'm afraid convenience is a big problem. M many of us, me included, all of us, probably we take the convenient decision, um, having things handed to us in uh, the most convenient uh, plug-and-play way, but sometimes taking... Uh, taking the more difficult route uh, definitely comes with uh, interesting experiences. That's also something I, I took from the conference today. Um, yeah, I think we have to wrap up. Um, there's a few things that I would like to share with our audience, and that's uh, upcoming events at Impact. Um, right now, we are installing an exhibition that will open soon. Um, but uh, before we open the exhibition, we have a next episode of Impact TV. I uh, hope we can get the slide for that. Uh, no, we'll first have the slide of the uh, exhibition that will open, uh, which is on the 4th of March. Um, it's Nadegui, that's Dutch for post-growth, by the art collective Disnovation.org, addressing our climate crisis uh, through existing economic and technological dogmas. Uh, it's a really interesting exhibition. Uh, I think our entire, entire building is getting a makeover for it, so I hope you can make it to come to Utrecht, maybe join us for the opening on the 4th of March. And I think it's just a few days prior or after that we'll have an Impact TV episode, but... Um, there is a slide, uh, which is on the 3rd of March, so it's a day uh, prior to the opening, with um, Dutch-Brazilian um, internet artist Ravel Rosendahl joining us for an hour-long chat about his work and what he f sees as interesting tendencies in arts and culture uh, today. So that's what we have ahead of us. Now I can only say thanks everyone for being with us um, at this Impact Online event. Um, you can join us uh, for some after chat, some um, exchange of thoughts and experiences in our virtual rooftop bar. Our host Andrei will welcome you. Uh, I hope to see you there because I'm going there also in a few minutes. Uh, and before I do that, Annette, uh, thanks a lot. It was really great uh, doing this together with you. Great, thank you.